Good morning, everyone. This is Mr. Couple. This is the lesson for my IBHL year one students. We're going to be talking today about equivalent resistance. So equivalent resistance is this idea that you can take complex circuits and uh, make them simple by just replacing a whole bunch of different resistors with a single resistor. And you're probably wondering what the heck is a resistor. So I should probably explain that first. All right, so generally what we say is that the resistance of a conducting wire is really small. So we did that calculation last class that if we had what was like a four millimeter wire made of copper, that it would actually need to be something like 5,000 meters long in order to have five ohms resistance. So generally because of this fact that you know conductors have very low resistance we we almost just ignore the resistance entirely so i mean you know it's it's not going to be correct it, it's wires have resistance you can't just ignore it but for the purposes of this class we're just going to approximate by saying that the resistance of a wire is zero so when we draw circuit diagrams here's an example of what a circuit diagram looks like when we draw circuit diagrams, the wires are, you know, resistors, not what I'm trying to say, wires, there we go, where the resistance can be ignored, we just draw a straight line. So if you see a straight line on a diagram like this, it means that whatever that conducting material is, the resistance can be ignored. But then when you see a box, like a big fat box like that, that means there's a conducting material whose resistance can't be ignored. And those devices are called resistors. This is what resistors look like in real life. They're these little tiny... Uh, things that have lines on them. The lines are, are color code that let you figure out what the resistance is. You can look up the color code. I'm not supposed to teach that. I'm not going to get into it. But generally, I mean, you can see how this looks like a box. And so we're just going to use that symbol, the box symbol, to represent a resistor. You might be wondering what do resistors do? So resistors determine the resistance in your circuit. So if you're building some complicated electronic device and you know that you want to have like five volts, well, then you just make sure that you put the correct resistance in your circuit so that there's a five volt potential difference across a certain point in the circuit. Those are called uh, voltage dividers. You could also say, oh, well, I want the current to never exceed, you know, 50 milliamps. Well, you can make sure that you set up your resistance accordingly with a certain size resistor so that your current never goes above a certain point. Okay, so the picture below shows a current through a conductor that has a resistance. This is a resistor. So the box means that it has a resistance. And so it's giving us the resistance here as being 15 ohms. Question one, it says determine the voltage, whoops, potential difference between points A and B. So the potential difference is the idea that like, you know, we have some charge that's going to flow to point A. It's then going to move to point B and we want to figure out, well, what's the amount of work that was done per charge to move that charge from A to B? So in other words, we're just looking at, well, how much energy is a charge going to lose when it flows through this resistor, right? Because the resistor has resistance. So when the current flows through it, it's going to be going bum, 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 like whacking into those lattice ions and it's going to lose energy. And so we want to actually determine what that amount of energy that it loses. Sometimes this is called the voltage drop. We want to determine that. Well, there, there's a very simple way to determine it because the current and the resistance tells you what the potential difference is going to be. And that's just Ohm's law, V equals IR. So Ohm's law can be applied between any two points on a circuit. Pick any two points, V equals IR. So if we calculate it, V equals IR, the I is five amps and the resistance is 15 ohms. And so we just have to do five times 15. Let's see, so four times 15 is 60. So another 15, that's 75. So there's a 75 volt potential difference between A and B. All right, so now what if instead of going between A and B, what if we look between B and C? So let's do that same thing, V equals IR. Okay, but this time, notice on our diagram, that's just a straight wire. So that means that, yeah, we'll still have five amps going through there, but the resistance on the straight wire is zero. And so that means that our potential difference is going to be zero. So what we say is that when current flows through a wire like this, we're going to approximate it as saying there's no energy loss. That's completely wrong. That's not how wires work. There is going to be a small amount of energy loss, but we're just going to ignore it because otherwise it'll make things a little bit more complicated than we want them to be in an introductory level course like this. 
Okay, question B, it says construct an expression for the power dissipated by the resistor. So we know we could actually solve this. We could figure out what the power being delivered to the resistor is, or like the amount of energy that the resistor is, is using per second. But I, I want to just derive an equation for this instead. And so we've, we already have an equation for power. So do you guys remember what the power equation is? If you guys are listening, do you remember what we said power is equal to? Right over to the side. Someone say it. I've been talking too long. Power is equal to um, current times potential difference. You got it. Oh, I'm so proud of you, Alberto, for saying potential difference. It's so hard to do that. I always say voltage. So power equals current times potential difference. PIV is what I usually call that one. All right, but now notice, I want to know the power in terms of I and R, not V. So if we know the, if we know the current and we know the potential difference, Boom, the power is really easy. But what if all we know is just I and R, like it says here? I mean, I guess we know the potential difference now because we just found it at 75 volts. But what if we just want to find it without having to calculate the, the voltage first? Well, the shortcut is that we can say, well, if P equals to IV and V is equal to IR, then we notice that we get this new equation, which we can use which says power is equal to I squared R. And that's a perfectly valid equation that you can use uh, for a resistor. If you want to find the power that the resistor is going to be using or dissipating, then you can just take the current squared times the resistance. And we should be able to show that that works. So if we take the current, which was five, and we square it, you get 25. Uh, and then the, the power would be 25 times 15. And so that's how we could calculate the power. We should get the same answer if we took current of five times 75. So 5 times 75 should be the same thing as 25 times 15. Oh, I guess I need that calculator after all. Hold on a second. Oh, you guys get to see my, my background screen there. Okay, let's see. So calculator. Okay, so what I was saying was 5 squared times, so the current squared times the resistance will give us the same answer as the current times the potential difference. 5 times 75. And so those are equivalent statements. So P equals IV is the exact same thing as I squared R. And while we're at it, I mean, we might as well just solve, uh, do another one also. Hey, my camera's gone, okay. So we might as well also do, instead of substituting for V, we can substitute for I. So if P equals to IV, so instead of getting rid of the V equals IR, we can put in the I. And so we would say that I is equal to V over R from Ohm's law, so the current is equal to the potential difference divided by the resistance. And then that's going to get multiplied by the potential difference. And so we get a second equation, which says that you could also find the power by taking V squared over R. Depending upon the situation, depending upon the circuit, uh, you're going to want to use one of these equations. So you'll either use P equals IV, which is generally the default one. But if you don't know the potential difference or the current, you could try using one of these other ones. So if you know the, the potential difference and you know the resistance, boom, V squared over R. If you know the current and you know the resistance, then you could use I squared R. It's just a shortcut. I mean, you don't have to do this. Like you could just use V equals IR and use P equals IV and just use them one then the other, or you can just use these two shortcut equations. Okay, I just wanted to mention that because I hadn't really talked about it yet. So I just talked about what a resistor is. So it's a device that um, creates resistance inside a circuit. We cleverly use this device to create the potential differences that we want between two points, special points in a circuit, or to regulate the flow of current in the circuit. So for example, if you guys ever seen those LED lights, like those little tiny lights, if you just were to take one of those and hook it up to a battery, it would blow up, it would burn out. So you have to always connect the resistor, and then that way it'll limit the current so the bulb doesn't get blown out. All right, let's see. So number two. All right, there's two types of circuits. Uh, I'm just going to have you guys stare at these for a second because I have to cough. Okay, I'm done. Electronic devices utilize complex configurations of resistors to regulate current and voltage. We are concerned primarily with two types of circuits, the series circuit and the parallel circuit. So hopefully you guys are a little bit familiar with these. You should be coming into this from um, ninth grade physics. So what I want to do is just give a qualitative overview of these circuits and just kind of understand what's going on from the perspective of current or charge and the perspective of energy or potential difference. And so what we're going to do is we're going to apply the conservation of energy 
and apply the conservation of charge. Those are the principles of physics. We're going to apply them to each circuit, and that's going to allow us to write down a, a statement or a, a fact about each circuit. First up, let's look at the series circuit. So what makes this a series circuit is that all of the resistors are co connected end to end to end. So if you're a current coming out of this battery, you're going to have to flow through this resistor and then flow through the next resistor and then flow through the next resistor before you can finally go back to the battery. So the current has to flow through every single resistor. That's a series circuit. Contrast that to the parallel circuit. So if you're a current that comes up this way, you can actually split down this path or keep going and then split down this path or go off this path before coming back together again and then going to the circuit. So it's conceivable that like if you imagine yourself to be a charge flowing through this wire that you could only go, you can make it through one resistor and back to the battery again. So you'd only have to deliver your energy to a single resistor instead of having to deliver it to all three resistors. And so that's the main difference between these circuits. Uh, generally, what I usually do in the classroom is I have you guys actually build these circuits and connect them and see what's going to be different about them. But, you know, we I, I might be able to do something in the virtual environment. I'll see about that. But maybe that'll be for another time. Let's see. So, okay, so now we want to apply the law of conservation of energy to the series circuit and to the parallel circuit. Okay, so let's think about what conservation energy says. So conservation energy says when the charges flow through these resistors, they're going to lose energy, but they can only lose as much energy as they were given. So if you imagine a charge, you know, coming back to this battery, when it goes through the battery, it's going to gain uh, potential. It's going to it's going to gain energy. So it's going to kind of get filled filled up. And then that charge will go out to the circuit and it's, it'll be here with all of its energy. It'll then pass through the first resistor and it will lose some of its energy. It'll then go through the next resistor and it'll lose some more of its energy until finally, after going through every single resistor, it has to be back to where it started from, which is to have no energy at all. So the, the way to think about this is just like, hey, uh, if you're gonna make it through a resistor, you're gonna need to lose energy and you can only lose as much energy as you have. So if we give a total potential difference from here to here of V, then the total potential difference across all three of these guys is gonna to have to be equal to V. So the expression that we write is to say that all of these potential differences across each resistor are gonna add up to the total potential difference across all three of them. Hopefully that makes sense, but it's just the conservation energy idea. So you can't lose all the energy across the first resistor because then there wouldn't be any energy left to get through the next resistors. So you have to lose a little bit across the first one, a little bit across the second one, and a little bit across the third one so that all the energy lost is equal to the total that was given to it by the power source or by the uh, voltage source. So the way we write this down for a series circuit is we say that V is equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3. And that's just simply conservation energy. It's like the the potential difference or the energy lost across each resistor has to sum up, total up to the total energy that was given to them. Now, if you look at the parallel circuit though, so if you get filled up at the battery, if you're a charge and you get filled up and you reach this junction right here, you have your full charge. Well, you get to pick, do you go this way or do you keep going? Well, I mean, whatever, you just it does whatever it does based on whatever path has less resistance, you're going to more likely to take that path. We don't know the resistances of these paths, but the point is if a charge flows through this resistor, it's going to lose all of its energy because now it can go straight back to, to the battery. We usually call this the ground. Like it's the, it's fallen down. It's like lost all its energy. And so notice that if the charge hadn't taken that path, it would go to the next one and it would still be full because all it did was pass down this wire. It didn't lose any energy going through that wire. And then again, it would go donk and it would drop down and lose all its energy. Or it could keep going to the next one, still be full and it drop down and lose all its energy. So what we say then is just like, so basically the way to think about it is that this line up here, no matter where you go on this line, the charges have full energy. And then no matter where you go on this bottom line, the charges have lost all their energy. And so this is just, we can see that no matter how you connect between this high potential and this low potential, no matter how you connect the device across those two lines, it's going to have the same potential difference. Because the, the at any point along this line, you have high potential 
And at any point along the lower line, you have low potential. And so no matter how you connect the device between those two lines, it's going to have to have the same potential difference. And so we can write down this expression that says V, I'll do it in blue, V equals to V1 equals to V2 equals to V3. So in the case of the parallel circuit, no matter which branch you take, no matter which path you take, whether it's through the first resistor, the second one, or the third one, it's going to be the same potential difference. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a little bit confusing stuff when you're first learning it, but it's really important. This is what's going to form the basis of everything we do from this point forward. Okay, let's talk about conservation of charge. So I know I, ha I don't think I taught you guys this because I had to cut stuff out. Conservation of charge just says that uh, charge can't be created or destroyed. So uh, the net charge can't be created or destroyed is what I should say. You can, you know, it's like if a little bit of positive charge gets created, a little bit of negative charge has to also get created to balance it out. Um, if an object becomes positively charged, it's because it lost some negative charge. It's conservation of charge. So what conservation of charge says is no matter where you look at a circuit, so like if I look at this point here, then the amount of charge that's passing by per second has to stay the same. And if I look here, it has to stay the same. And if I look here, it has to stay the same. It has to stay the same. And the reason why is because there's only one path for that charge to take. It doesn't, you know, however many charges pass by here. So if three charges are here, then three have to be here and then three have to be here. So like, it's not like you're suddenly going to, charges are suddenly going to vanish. And so that's the conservation of charge idea is that the same amount of charge per second is going to pass by everywhere on the same line. And since the series circuit only has one line, right, there's only one way for the current to flow, then no matter where you are on that path, you're going to see the same amount of charges passing by per second. So we would write this as I1, or I, the total I through the, through the cell or the battery here, is going to equal to the current through the first resistor and the current through the second resistor and the current through the third resistor. That all these currents, they all have to be the same. But when you look at the parallel circuit, you notice that that's not the case. So this current here will come up, whoops. Oh, I just dropped my pen. So the current from the battery will move up and it'll reach this junction right here. So we have current I coming in, but then current I1 is gonna flow down this way and then current I2 will flow down this way and then current I3 will flow down that way. And so what you'll notice is the current is actually splitting. That if we had, you know, like, I don't know what to say. Like if we had five amps coming out through here, then maybe you'd have like one amp here. Maybe you'd have like half an amp here. And then that would leave how many through the third path? Um, I got to do math real quick. 3.5? So 3.5 would go down that path. Jeez. So, and, and that's just all dependent upon how much resistance there is. So the less resistance there is, the more likely charge is going to be to take that path. So in this configuration, if these were the actual currents, then that third path would be the lowest resistance. So most of the charges are going to take that path. But the point is that whatever current goes into this point, the same amount of current has to come out of that point. And so you can see that we just need to add up all these currents to equal the total current that came in. And so that will give us the equation that I equals to I1 plus I2 plus I3. And those are the rules for parallel and series circuits. So the thing to notice is that in a series circuit, you have to sum the energy. In a parallel circuit, you sum the currents. And so that's the main difference. And then what's what's equal in a series circuit is they all have the same current. In the parallel circuit, they have the same potential difference. So we'd say this, they all have the same current. And then in the parallel circuit, they all have the same potential difference. Let's write it as PD. And if you can remember those rules, circuits are easy, super easy. You just have to remember these basic rules. And so I just tried to logically explain them to you guys from the basis of conservation of energy and conservation of charge, those fundamental principles of physics. So I'm going to pause at this point to get uh, your thoughts on this, uh, what questions you have for me, things like that. If anything wasn't clear, you should ask me now and I can re-explain re it. I'll take the silence as understanding. So now we're going to talk about this concept called equivalent resistance. So equivalent resistance is the value of a single resistor 
used to replace a more complex configuration of resistors. Any desired resistance can be achieved through a clever use of resistor combinations. So here we have a series circuit. So all I'm doing is I'm just pulling out you know, this part up here. I'm just taking this part of the circuit and I'm just saying, hey, let's just pull that out. There's three resistors connected together. I'll call this point A and I'll call that point B. So all those resistors between points A and B, what we're gonna do is we're gonna swap them out with a single resistor over here. And that single resistor, we'll call its resistance R total. That's the equivalent resistance. So you'll notice here that we can take three resistors and replace them with a single resistor. Now, why is this useful? Well, it's much easier to find the potential difference across a single resistor like we did right here. It's really easy to find the potential difference across one resistor. It's not so easy to find it across complex configurations of resistors. And so generally we want to do this. The other reason is because let's say that like you open up your your toolkit and all you have is a 50 ohm resistor, but you really want a, a thousand ohm resistor. Well, you could just take various combinations of 50 ohm resistors and put them together to create the equivalent resistance of, you know, a, a thousand ohms, if that's what you're looking for, or 500 ohms, whatever you're looking for. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. So part A, determine an expression for V, the potential difference between points A and B in each situation. So we want to write down what's the potential difference between A and B when we had this complex set of three resistors, and then what's the potential difference between A and B when we had this single resistor. All right, so we talked about up here that when you have a series circuit, the potential difference, you know, the, the potential difference across these two points from here to here is simply equal to the battery's potential difference. And so that was our first equation, that V is equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3. So I'm gonna start by writing that down for this complicated circuit over here. So V is equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3. Okay, next. The other thing is that all of these resistors have to have the same current. So I1, I2, I3 are all equal to I. And so that's the second trick that we're gonna exploit so that way, when we write out, we know what V has to be for each resistor. So V equals to I R1 plus I R2 plus I R3. So what I just did there was I just used Ohm's law, V equals I R. But for the first V, so for V1, I'm going to use the current through one and the resistance of one. But the current through one is the same as the current through all of them. So they all have this same current that flows through all of them. And now I can just factor out that current to get this expression that says V is equal to I times the quantity of R1 plus R2 plus R3. And that's our potential difference between the two points A and B. The potential difference across all three resistors is simply the sum of the potential differences across each resistor. And we get this result. Well, over here, it's really simple. So V equals to IR, we don't have to do anything. And then that R is just gonna be R total. So when we write this out, we could say V is equal to I times R total. And so by comparing these two equations with each other, we can see what R total is. So R total is the stuff that's in the parentheses over here. What, how do, what's the best way I wanna do this? I'm just, ah. Uh. I'll just go like this. So R total is there. And then over here we have that. So we can write down an expression that says, oh, well, R total is just R1 plus R2 plus R3. So that's the equivalent resistance. So for a series, so for a series, R total is just equal to R1 plus R2 plus R3. So what we did was we just solved the circuit or we, we solved the potential difference when it was a complex arrangement of resistors and then solved it when it was this simple arrangement. And just by visual comparison between these equations, we were able to figure out that this one resistor here acts like it was just these guys added together. And, and that makes perfect sense, right? It's just like, it's acting like one big giant resistor. But if we connect them in parallel, something different happens. So these resistors are connected in parallel. It looks a little different than the other drawing I drew. Uh, but realize that this point here and this point here, all, res all three resistors are connected to those same two points. 
And so that's what makes resistors in parallel is if they're connected across the same two points. So if every resistor is connected across the same two points, then every resistor has to have the same potential difference across it. Determine an expression for I, the current that enters the junction at point A in each situation. So instead of finding the potential difference between the two points, what we want to do instead is we want to figure out how much current is flowing in to each of these guys, how much current is flowing into that point A. Okay, well, we're going to start the same way we started the other one. We're going to go up here. We're going to look at our uh, equation for a parallel circuit for I. So I is equal to I1 plus I2 plus I3. So we'll start with that. So I equals to I1 plus I2 plus I3. But then this time, instead of using substituting for the V's, we're substituting for the I's. And from V equals to IR, we know that I equals to V over R. So we just solve it for I. We also know that all three of these resistors, they all have to have the same uh, potential difference. They're all going to have the same V. So when I go to substitute in here, I can say I equals to V over R1 plus V over R2 plus V over R3. And every single one of these resistors has to have the same potential difference because that's what happens in parallel configuration. We'll do the same thing we did up here. Instead of factoring out the same I's, like for a series, we're going to factor out the same V. And when we do that, we end up with I is equal to V times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. Now, when we do it for the other one, just like up here, we're going to use not V equals IR because we don't want the potential difference. We're going to use I equals V over R total. And then what I'm going to do is rewrite this, rearrange it a little bit so that it looks visually identical. So that way we can do the same thing we did up here where we visually compare them to each other. So I want these two equations to look the same. So that way I can just say, hey, I want to look at I want to look at this part here and figure out what it's equivalent to in the other one. So I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to say that I is equal to V times 1 over R total. And that's the same thing, right? Division is multiplied by the reciprocal. It's the same process. And now by visual comparison, we can see that 1 over R total is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. And so that's our total resistance is 1 over R total is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. And then that's for parallel, equivalent resistance in parallel. I don't like to write the equation this way because it's kind of a disgusting, gross mess. Because usually what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve for R total. And so I think it's weird to have this as 1 over R. So what you can do is you can flip both sides but then it looks it looks horrible if you do that. So you would say that uh, if I want to solve for what R total is, then R total would have to be 1 over this whole side here. So if I took this whole side and flipped it, and it took this side and flipped it, I'd end up with R total equals to 1 over 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. And that's more appropriate for what you'll typically be doing is you would plug in these R's. It looks gross, though. So what we can do is we can use the fact, you know, from math class, we know that something to the negative 1 is that thing, uh, the reciprocal of it, right? So x to the negative 1 is just 1 over x. So over here, I'm going to rewrite this in, in the preferred, my preferred way. This is not the IB preferred way. Like, this won't be in the data booklet. But Mr. Keppel likes to do it this way. So I like to say that R total is equal to R1 to the negative 1 plus R2 to the negative 1 plus R3 to the negative 1. And then that whole thing to the negative 1. And so that 1 over the whole thing, that's the whole thing to the negative 1. And then each individual reciprocal is each of those individual to the negative 1 powers. So whatever one you like here, they're all the same. Uh, like I said, I prefer to use this one down here. 
uh, the main reason I'll just show you guys real quick. So the reason I like to do that is because when you have a calculator out, so like, let me just make up some random numbers for these. So let's say this guy is like four, this guy is like 12 and this guy's uh, two. So those are the random resistances that I'm making up. So if I wanted to find the equivalent resistance of those guys, I would just go, all right, so I want to do quantity, open parentheses, four to the negative one, which one's the negative one, that one? Four to the negative one plus 12 to the negative one plus two to the negative one. And then just take the whole thing to the negative one and that will give me the equivalent resistance. So the equivalent resistance would be 1.2 ohms. All right, that's it guys. I'm done with this video. So I'm gonna upload, I haven't done it yet, but in a moment I'm gonna upload the Google Classroom file uh, assignment. I'll just show you what that looks like. Uh, it's gonna be some questions for you to answer like this. So I'm gonna actually put some numbers to these problems and then have you actually solve them out with these numbers. Okay, and then that's it. This this last one is a question I put on my test last year, so you guys can get a feeling for what like you know more complicated, challenging problems are. All right, so I'm gonna post this right now. I'm gonna walk over to my computer, post this up, and then I would like you guys to answer those questions, and then I will again post the solutions to this with background music, and then I'll see you guys later. All right, have a great day. Bye.